Hi, I'm Forrest Kinney, author of Pattern Play and a lot of other books on music. Welcome to the Musicality Podcast. Ever wondered why some people seem to have a gift for music? Have you ever wished that you could play by ear, sing in tune, improvise and jam? You're in the right place. Time to turn those wishes into reality. Welcome to the Musicality Podcast with your host, Christopher Sutton. Hi, this is Christopher, founder of Musical You, and welcome to the Musicality Podcast. Today I'm getting to speak with someone I've been hearing about for years, Forrest Kinney. He's the author of the Pattern Play series of piano books, which you might remember past guests Natalie Weber and Sarah Campbell both mentioned as being fantastic for helping students get off the page and start to be more creative in their music making. He's actually the author of 35 music learning books. He's also a highly in-demand speaker, giving presentations on all the interesting things we'll be talking about today, and still regularly performs, including dozens of private appearances at a certain billionaire's house. Stay tuned to hear about that. In this conversation, we talk about Forrest's own musical beginnings, and whether such a creative musician as himself credits talent for that creative success. We talk about the four arts of music that you can pick from and blend to find your own true identity as a musician. And we talk about a creative way to think about music theory, and his opinion on scales that often gets him in trouble. If you've ever felt like learning to play sheet music note by note just wasn't the right fit for you as a musician, or you've felt the urge to create even though you don't consider yourself a creative, you are going to love this episode. I should mention there were a couple of bits here where our connection got a bit patchy, and you might hear a few short cutouts or glitches. Stick with it, they were very short sections, and I don't think they'll affect how much you're going to get out of listening to this. My name is Christopher Sutton, and this is the Musicality Podcast from Musical You. Welcome to the show, Forrest. Thank you for joining us today. Well, thank you for having me. I would love to start at the beginning because I know an awful lot about what you do now and the many books you've published and the impact you've had on music education, but I don't know that much about where you got started in music, and I'd love to learn more about that early experience for you. Oh, boy, do we have to go there? I might need a therapist <laughs> to, to, to talk about this with you. Uh, you know, I, I say that only in half in jest because... I had actually a wonderful start to music because I didn't have a teacher. When I was a kid, I would walk by the family piano and I'd sit down and I would just make sounds. And I always loved the sounds on that old piano. And I basically did this for years. And my older siblings had had terrible experiences with piano lessons. So I think my mother was quite relieved when I said I wanted to study saxophone. And so I didn't actually take a piano lesson until I was nearly 16 years old. And that's when it became problematic, because as you might guess, I was way behind my peers. I had a friend that was playing a Beethoven sonata in the first recital, and I was playing a tiny little piece from Bartok for Children. And I was humiliated. I mean, you know, I knew I was smart. I knew I loved music, but I, I, my technique was terrible. I, I shook. I remember my hand shaking so badly when I reached for the final note, which was a B. My hand was shaking so much that it was hovering over A, B, and C. And finally, I just took a plunge and hit it. And fortunately, I got the B correctly. But my, my legs would shake on the piano. So... That's why I'm saying, boy, to go back to that period is difficult for me because it was a time of nerves and frustration and humiliation because the, the, the classical approach really didn't address who I was as a musician. Mm, that's a really interesting comment. So how did the next few years go for you then if this wasn't a good fit for who you were going to go on to become as a musician? Well, fortunately, my piano teacher... Uh, gave me a great musical education. We went to concerts. Um, we listened to music at his house. I mean, he did a remarkable job of teaching me about music. But the physical difficulty of playing the piano, I got it intellectually quickly, how to read, how to play. But what a struggle physically um, and emotionally to be able to perform and play. 
And what happened during that time is I fell in love with literature and was determined to do a good job. But that whole ability to improvise and make my own versions of songs, which now I call arranging, all that kind of fell away while I tried to become a classical musician. And I went on to college and, and tried to study, but finally I kind of crashed and burned when I realized that wasn't who I was. So I actually quit piano for a year when I was 20. It was kind of a, oh, you could call it a metaphysical crisis or something. I wondered who I was. And then I really became, I think, who I was. I, I put my music books away and all I did for two years was improvise with my eyes closed. And I rediscovered that childlike love of music that I'd had as a kid that I'd completely forgotten about in this quest to become this incredibly good musician who could play Chopin etudes at blazing speed. And I kind of recovered that childlike love and joy, and I started teaching again. And that's when I decided, boy, I have to figure out a way to help others learn to improvise, because to me, it was the heart and soul of a piano. And I struggled and struggled. And finally, I took some jazz lessons and started to kind of understand music as a language of patterns. And I started inventing patterns for my students, very short, simple musical accompaniments that they could use to start making sounds and, and improvising with. And from those humble beginnings grew this you know, infatuation with the series I call Pattern Play. And I've come up with, I think I've published over 400 patterns now for people, and there's a lot more still to come. So, but that's how it all began, with the love of improvising, the loss of improvising, and the return to it. Fantastic. That's so interesting. And I, I think what I have to ask is, in that moment when you kind of put the sheet music away and decided to close your eyes and try improvising, did it all come super easily to you? Was it, the, was it, you know, you could always improvise and you just hadn't tried to, or was that something you then had to learn? You know, by that point, I had done it since I was a child. Um, and now, of course, I knew a lot about music. So I kind of put the two together, that childlike intuition I had, that love of exploring and just making sounds. And then you know, marrying it to all the knowledge I gained in college and high school. So I started improvising in the different classical styles. I remember once thinking, oh, I love Debussy, and I'm going to improvise in the style of Claire de Lune. And so it was more of a directed improvisation. But no, I didn't really have to relearn it. It was more just remember how to do it. Remember that kind of childlike love of exploring. Fascinating. I... I am such a fan of the pattern play approach. I think it's so smart the way you've put it together. And the reason I say that is I'm sure a lot of the people listening have felt that pain of, you know, being put on the sheet music route and told to just play the notes on the page and right. felt that urge to improvise and kind of felt like, oh, if I could just make it up and just play freely, that would be much better. But sometimes there's a really big gulf there. And it sounds like for you, you'd kind of been nurturing that improvisation along the way, and you were able to then kind of challenge, uh, channel the knowledge and vocabulary you'd built up. But for someone who is feeling like, I want to dabble, but I don't know how, I, I think the way you've put together pattern play is really elegant. So maybe you could just explain that, you know, for someone in that position of wanting to improvise and not knowing where to start, or even just more broadly wanting to create, what, what have you put together with the pattern play approach? Yeah, you know, I think you've, you've said it very nicely that people have an instinctive desire to want to do it. And I always compare it to speaking. When we were children, our relationship with language is that we spoke it spontaneously. And that's actually how music used to be in the Baroque period, um, you know, in the time of Bach, before it was printed. People don't realize it, but only eight of 1,800 works of Bach were printed in his lifetime. I mean, there just really wasn't printed music available. It was all either improvised or written by hand. And so 
music was conceived of as speech, and it was meant to be done spontaneously. But once literature came out in the 19th century and, and the publishing industry, that's when this whole shift happened, and music became about reading scripts and reciting scripts. And a lot of us come into piano lessons and think, you know, there's something wrong here. It isn't just about reciting the notes of another person. Isn't it supposed to be about creating your own? Isn't that what art is about? I mean, when you study creative writing, you're supposed to create your own stories or you study painting, you're supposed to create your own painting. So wait, isn't something wrong here that in music, we learn the music of others and stop there. And so I agree with those people who feel that. To me, they've got a natural feeling that, hey, music should be a spoken language, and you should be able to sit down at a piano and say, you know, I'm in an A-flat Lydian sort of mood today, or, you know, I'm in an E-flat minor kind of mood, and they should be able to just sit down and play in that key and find the music that fits their feelings. And so the pattern play approach is basically very short uh, accompaniment patterns that are in countless different styles. One of the issues I had with approaches to improvisation that I saw was they were all based on jazz idioms. Now, I have things in jazz and blues idioms, but uh, some of the favorite patterns I've ever taught people are in New Age pat, uh, styles. Um, there's one called Persia that I teach all the time with pencils in the piano that it, you know people just love it. Um, I teach an Irish pattern, some music from Africa. I mean, you can improvise with anything. So the pattern play approach is basically the short, very short, like usually 12 notes or less, patterns that you learn. And then you're given a set of keys to create with, like just create on black keys or just create melodies on white keys or just create with D, E flat, F sharp, G and A, the first notes of a Persian scale. And you begin with these increments, these small bits of music, and explore and feel successful, and then you keep adding in more layers. But all along, you're, you're exploring like a child, just listening and responding and speaking. So there's really no reading involved except for you know, basically reading the pattern from the page. But even then, I've created videos now that you can learn from the videos without any reading required. Perfect. And I, I wonder if you wouldn't mind just giving us a quick example of what kind of music would be produced when you take this approach. Well, I'll give you an, one example or two examples, but really there are literally hundreds of different styles in my books. And that's what I think I like most about my books is the diversity. So let me start with one of the most exotic patterns. Um, and it's not that hard. With your right hand, you can simply start by playing um, D, E-flat, F-sharp, and G. The first four notes of what's called a Persian scale. Now, what I like to do is put a pencil, lay a pencil on top of the strings, if you have a grand piano, and then it makes it sound like this. It gives it quite an exotic sound. And what's nice about that is you know, you, you're not ever going to make a mistake because it sounds so weird that nobody knows what's right or wrong and who cares. And in the bass, all you do is play a D and an A. Now, what you can do is place a book, preferably a pattern play book, over the top <laughs> of the bass strings to create this sound. And that makes it into kind of a drum. Now, I, I left the book off the lowest string so it would ring. But then I put the book over the upper note, the A, so it gets a percussive sound. So all together, now I'm playing that D and, a in, D and A in any rhythm that I want. For example, if I'm a beginner, I might just do simple quarter notes. If I'm a more advanced player, any pattern can be adapted to who I am. So I might play it like this. Now, 
Now, the complete scale is actually D, E flat, F sharp, G, and then A, B flat, C sharp, D. So you can make quite a lot of music. One of the things I love about pattern play, as I just mentioned, is that everybody can adapt it to their own mood and their own abilities. An advanced player could do something like this. A beginner can do this. And a beginner can come back two years later and do this. So that's one example. I don't know if you want another one or not. Wonderful. Maybe we can come back for another later in the conversation. I'd love that. Sure. Um, one thing I should mention, I just made a, a short 40-second video uh, that shows how you do this with a grand piano, and it's on my YouTube channel, so people could look at that. Now, I'm always asked if this can work with an upright piano, but you know, sadly, there's something in the universe called gravity. Well, actually, <laughs> maybe it's a good thing we have gravity, but if you put pencils on the strings of an upright piano, gravity just sends them right down. So, no, it doesn't work on an upright piano. <laughs> and we should probably put in a, a legal disclaimer to not go off and put random objects into your piano teacher's yeah. piano when they're not looking. <laughs> yes, exactly. No dairy products, for example. <laughs> um, but, you know, there are things that work really nicely, like aluminum foil makes an interesting sound. I like credit cards. Um, sometimes that's the best use for credit cards. Um, <laughs> I, I like paper. Uh, I've explored a bunch of different things. But, mm. And I've been assured by piano technicians that these kind of things lightly placed on the strings is not going to damage them. You have to be careful, though, to use long pencils because if you use a short pencil, um, I one time had it drop between the strings and land on the soundboard, and that wasn't a good experience. I see. Well, lest our audience think that your pattern playbooks are only about strange, exotic sounds, uh, we'll definitely have to circle back and give another example later, because as you said, there's a, a huge variety there, most of which I imagine don't involve putting pencils into your piano. Yeah, actually, that's the only one. Um, <laughs> but yeah, maybe I should do a blues pattern, since mm. probably a lot of people would expect uh, it to be about jazz and blues. Sure. So that um, slightly touches on something I was really keen to return to, which was you made a very interesting remark when talking about your own musical journey, which was that it was very much about your identity and who you were or wanted to be as a musician. And I think we have all of these words that come with baggage. And I, even in the conversation so far, have been slightly hesitant to say improvise or be creative, because I know that for a lot of people listening, those ideas just seem out of reach. You know, I, I'm a, a geeky guy by background. I don't consider myself a creative person. And it took a while for me to realize I could create things in music, even though I didn't consider myself an artist. And I'd love if you could just share a bit about your four arts model and how that can help people realize there are different identities available to them in music. Yeah, that's, I think that's really my main focus is to share what I call the four arts. I mean, we've talked about improvising, but that's only one of four main ways I think that there are to be creative in music. Um, a second way is, is arranging. Um, now, arranging is often confused with improvising. But arranging is when you start with somebody else's melody or theme and you take your knowledge of chords and styling chords and things like that and you make your own version of a song. Now, traditionally, people were taught to do that first. For example, Bach taught something called figured bass, which was basically an understanding of chords and harmony with the understanding that once you knew how to do that, you could take a hymn tune or a folk tune, and you could make your own version of it. And then, on the repeats, you would vary it, and that was called improvising. So the art of improvising was actually taught after the art of arranging. Now, what I've done is created a series of books called Chord Play, and now my new series, Puzzle Play, which just teaches this without any improvisation, just an understanding that here's chords, here are techniques of what you can do with them, here's ways you can make your own versions of tunes. Now, 
it's a very fun and creative art, and I consider it to be the most practical of musical arts. I made my living as a musician. I quit teaching for a few years and made my living entirely as a musician just playing my arrangements at events. Um, so what I was hired to do was provide music for mm. events, but people did not want to hear a Beethoven sonata. They wanted to hear Elton John, or they wanted to hear the Beatles. They wanted to hear familiar melodies, um, and they didn't even want to hear that much improvisation. They wanted to hear things they knew. So the art of arranging is what I learned, and basically learned how to arrange a piece like Girl from Ipanema, or a standard like Georgia, or Summertime, or even play Pachelbel's Canon, or Vivaldi's Spring, in my own way. And that's a tremendously useful art if you want to work, as I've done, in churches or on cruise ships. Um, I i don't know if you know this, but I've played at Bill Gates' house 26 times. And the reason I get asked back, and I've been told this, is because Melinda Gates likes the fact that I play a diversity of styles and, and arrange my own arrangements. I don't play scores. I go in and I play my own arrangements of these pieces. So that's a, a very useful art to have and an enjoyable one. The third art is composing, and this includes songwriting, which I've done a lot of. I have a vocalist friend that he and I compose a lot of music together. And basically, composing is writing musical essays, and there's a whole craft that comes with that of understanding notation and such. And then the fourth art is the art of interpreting. And this is not merely reading a, a musical score, but bringing yourself into it. So I can pick up or, or uh, somebody can pick up a, a score and say, you know, how do I feel? How can I shape these notes to express who I am? And this kind of goes against a lot of the notion that mm -hmm. there's a correct way, uh, one way in which you must play a score. And that whole ethic goes against this co-creative idea. I believe that if we're playing a score as an artist, as a creator, we need to bring ourselves into the score and add who we are to it. Um, otherwise, it becomes a skill rather than an, a creative art. So these are the four different ways of being a musician. And, you know, I've met some people who are natural interpreters, but people like me, we are natural uh, improvisers, and we're not happy unless we're improvising every day. So I share this model with people to remind them that if you're not happy with music, it's probably because your teacher asks that you be a kind of musician that you're naturally not. Interesting. And I noticed that you didn't mention there the identity of playing like a robot, never making any mistakes, and always playing things in exactly the same way <laughs> according to the sheet music. But see, exactly. And that's because that's not an art. That's a skill. A robot can be absolutely precise and skillful, but that really has nothing to do with, with creativity. You, somebody can listen to a robot and say, wow, how artistic, because it's really programmed skillfully. And OK, it might be artistic, but it's not creative. For it to be creative, by nature, it has to be different every time. And so the true interpreter of a, of a Chopin nocturne will, like Chopin did, play it differently every time they sit down and play it. And that is a historical fact. Those who heard Chopin play say that he never played his pieces the same way twice. In fact, there's a funny story where he was at one of his salons and he played a Chopin, one of his nocturnes. And somebody came up to him and said, Maestro, that was lovely. Could you please play it again for us? And he said, yes, after I take a little break, I'll, I'll play it again. So he goes off and he comes back and he sits down at the, at the keyboard and plays a, a, a quite a different piece. And the audience member comes up afterwards and says, maestro, that was lovely, but I kind of wish you'd played the, that other piece again. And Chopin said, well, I did. <laughs> <laughs> and that's what a creative person does. It's always going to be fresh and different. I think what I love about the way you talk about these things and, and the way you teach them is it provides such a variety of entry points to musical creativity. 
And like I touched on before, I think for a lot of people, there's a real barrier there because they don't think of themselves as a creative. And even if they picked up the instrument because they had that urge to put something out there into the world, we have such a cultural assumption about what it means to be a composer that it, yep. it, it makes a lot of people feel like they don't have permission to or they don't have the gift they would need to. And so I, I love the way you provide lots of different ideas about how you can express yourself in music. Yeah, you're, I think you've touched on something so essential. I think a lot of people walk away from music lessons feeling like they don't have what it takes. And it's, it's because education is so limited and based on such narrow assumptions. My understanding is that music is just like language that anybody can learn to speak it and anybody can be spontaneous making different sentences all the time. And the reason we can all do that is because we were not educated. We were, our intuition was trusted. We were interacted with, we learned to speak. And if, if we're, if we're introduced to music in a certain way, then I think we can have those same kind of creative or creative free ranging abilities um, I think anybody can. And I think one of the things that's really kept people from feeling creative is this notion of talent. People think, oh, I don't have the talent. You know, I didn't have talent either when I began. I was a total klutz. But so I don't believe in talent. What I believe in is love. I loved music. And so I stuck with it. And, you know, I learned talent. I developed talent out of that love. And so I always say, you know, the amateur musician, the word amateur comes from the French or Latin meaning to love. Um, the amateur who loves music, to me, can develop over time all the talent they need to do what they want to do if they just stick with it. I really wish I could play what you just said for every person on their first day of picking up an instrument. <laughs> I think that would, that would go a long way to fixing some of the problems in music education. And, uh, you know, I think what's been clear from our conversation so far is that you and I both agree that the traditional methods of teaching music, or at least teaching an instrument, leave a lot to be desired. And I think a lot of people in that will point to the grading system and the need to pass exams and give recitals and kind of have checkboxes for whether you're improving or not. And what I wanted to ask you was, if we move completely away from that model, are we losing something, you know, for the particularly for the adult musician who wants some clear indication that they are getting results from their efforts? Is there an equivalent in this world of more creative music learning? Well, before I answer that question, let me uh, give you a prelude before I get into the fugue here. <laughs> um, when we say traditional, I always laugh because mm. traditional only goes back as far as basically the 19th century. When the, when the printing industry really kicked in and method books really kicked in and literature became available for the first time, it was only in the middle of the 19th century when performers like Clara Schumann began playing the music of other people. Prior to then, uh, you know, someone like Mozart or Chopin, they wouldn't dream of giving a concert and playing the music of others, just like a pop musician today wouldn't really get up and do covers of Beatles songs during their concert. They're expected to play their own music. And so the, the rise of conservatories and music schools in the 19th century began to promote this idea of what I call the actor metaphor of, of playing the music of other people. And that's when the modern ways of teaching began. And now that's called traditional. But if you look back before that, the tradition of teaching was totally different. It was teaching improvisation. It was teaching composition. You couldn't be a musician in box time if you didn't improvise. You just couldn't. Uh, there was a, an audition in, eight, in um, 1725 at a church in Hamburg. Six different requirements at this audition, five of which involved being able to improvise. It was just that's the way it was. So I always laugh when people talk about tradition. So anyway, mm. now let me answer your question. I'm sorry, I had to get on one of I'm my soapboxes. I'm glad you did. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Um, 
there's a lot to be said for the the traditional approach since the 19th century. As long as we remember, it's only about one art, the art of in, of interpretation. And oftentimes it gets derailed with this idea of the urtext, of the correct, of the only way. If, if teachers won't get too stuck on that concept of polarizing creativity and correctness, then I think there's a lot to be said for that way of teaching. However, again, it's only one facet, and there aren't really comparable benchmarks when you're teaching improvising. It's just so personal and so multifaceted, you can't talk about a level two or a level three. Somebody might have a tremendous feeling for swing rhythm, for example, but they might really have an inability to have a sensitivity of consonance and dissonance, or vice versa. They might be wonderful at playing new age, spacey music, but they can't keep a beat. So it's so personal that I'd hate to put it on the same kind of, you know, strict levels of gradation. Mm -hmm. And so is it purely a matter of judging for yourself, am I better than last year? You know, I think that's really all that matters in art. I'm not a real fan of competition in art, because here's, here's the philosophy I live by. To me, art is all about discovering what makes you unique. In other words, why do we admire Beethoven so much? Because there's only, with only one Beethoven. Why do we admire Scarlatti and Debussy and Chopin? Because they were incredibly innovative. Nobody did what they did. And we admire people the most when they are willing to be themselves, when they're willing to be unique. And so, to me, the only meaningful question ultimately is, have I discovered who I am? Have I discovered what's made me unique? And so, that's kind of why I think I'm so at ease with myself as a musician. I don't play as well as, as you know, uh, Keith Jarrett. I never will. But I don't care because I play my music. I play what I love. And, you know, as great a musician as Beethoven is, he doesn't play Boogie Woogie as well as I do. Or he doesn't play <laughs> New Age piano as well as I do. Or he doesn't play Persian music because he never even knew of those styles. So... I feel like when we come into who we are and what we love, all that comparison and all that just kind of falls away. Wonderful. I love the clarity of your four arts method uh, model. I, I think the way you have those four categories is really nice and clear. But I would hate for someone listening to feel like they need to pick one of the four. <laughs> I wonder, oh, could you maybe right. talk a little bit about how each of them might influence the others or what a combination of them might look like? Oh, that's an excellent, excellent question. Yeah, I'm, I'm so glad you said that. Um, the way I understand the four arts is I compare them to language arts. So improvising is like what we're doing now. We are just making it up as we go along. And it's coming out pretty well, which I'm pleased about because, <laughs> you know, sometimes you wake up in the morning and your words don't flow as well. So, so improvising is speaking. Composing is basically being able to write essays and emails and things like that. It's, it's, it's using language in a written form to put your thoughts together. Um, Interpreting is, is basically being an actor, being able to, to read aloud and interpret and say it meaningfully. Um, and the art of arranging is like storytelling, being able to take uh, a joke that you've just heard or a story or, or an idea you want to convey and being able to put it in your own words. And so all these abilities in language support one another. For example, my literacy um, well, let me put it this way. People always say when they talk to me, Forrest, your ideas flow quite clearly. Well, you know why? It's because I've written 35 books <laughs> and I've spent, you know, 12 hours a day for years getting my thoughts super clear. And that's because I wrote. That's because I composed. And so that's helped me as an improviser of language by composing. Um, and, and so all the four arts, just like in language, support one another. The more you compose, the better you are improvising. The better you are improvising, 
the better you are at composing and arranging. And the more literature you study, the more it helps your ability as a composer as an, as, and as an improviser. For example, my ability as an improviser to improvise like Scarlatti or to improvise like Fats Waller are because I've studied so much literature. Perfect. I think that's such a, a great description. And um, I'm sure that helps people imagine, you know, what is the usefulness of learning all of that repertoire if I'm just going to sit down and do my own thing? Um, I think those two illustrations really help bring that to life. Yeah, well, I think I think the beauty is that all these paths are available. Now, most of the time I spend uh, improvising, but I go through phases where recently I wanted to uh, learn a piece by Ravel from the Tombeau de Couperin suite. And I just worked on that like crazy. And I have a duet partner and we're working on a Brazilian uh, composer's piano duet. And, and so I'll spend weeks sometimes just doing literature and then I'll spend eight months doing nothing but improvising and then four months doing nothing but composing. So what's wonderful is to have all the options so we can follow whatever desire we have. So I wanted to ask you about two kind of anti-heroes of this creative music world, um, two topics that are often held up as kind of the antithesis of creativity and music, one of which is music theory and the other is scales. And I'd love to get your perspective on those two and whether they're useful, and if so, how. <laughs> okay, well, good. Let's start with music theory, because that's less controversial. Um, what I have to say about scales has gotten me in a lot of trouble over the years. <laughs> but here's the thing with music theory. I love music theory, and I know it inside out. I know to how to, how to write uh, motets in the style of Palestrina. I know how to sharp fives and, and flat fives and sharp nines and sharp elevens and play in the Lydian mode with sharp elevens. You know, I love music theory, but I think generally it's taught poorly. And, and here's why I say this. Music theory is usually taught as a system of rules or prescriptions about how it should be done. And to me, that really is misunderstands the higher purpose of music theory. To me, music theory becomes a wonderful, beautiful thing when it's used to reveal hidden possibilities. So, for example, a student is playing and improvising for me in the key of D major. And I say, you know, that you might enjoy, I, I hear you wanting it to be an even brighter sound. Do you know what a Lydian mode is? And the student will say no. And I say, well, that's when you sharp the four of any major scale to give it this uplifting, spring-like, bright quality. Here, let's try that. And the student will, will try it. And they go, oh, I love that. And I say, okay, now let's try to do it say, try playing an A-flat Lydian, and we'll do that. So I'm teaching them theory, but they don't even know it, because what we're doing is we're exploring the possibilities of music. And so if music theory is used as a tool for exploring possibility, then it becomes this powerful tool. But if it's used to deny possibilities and say to people, like I once heard, don't go from a one chord to a three chord, because that's a weak progression. Well, what a bunch of... <laughs> Going from a one to a three chord has a particular beauty to it. And so I would say music theory is a great thing if taught properly, but it can be damaging if not taught properly. That's a beautiful way of putting it. And I love the description of it being used to enable possibilities rather than deny them. I think that's exactly yeah, that's the right way to think about it. That sums it up in one sentence. Right, right there. So it's time to get yourself in trouble and talk about scales. Oh my God, look at the time. I, <laughs> I, 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 oh, well, okay. Um, here's the thing. What is a scale? I always joke and I say a scale is basically a dead melody. Um, somebody years ago looked at a bunch of melodies and said, wow, they all have the same pitches in common. And if I organize the pitches um, in order, it, step by step, it's kind of like going up a ladder. And the word ladder in, in Latin is scale. And so that's really what it is. It's a, it's, a, it's a ladder of pitches. And in the 19th century, somebody came up with the idea of running up and down the keyboard to 
learn these in all the keys. And it really wasn't done in the Baroque period because scales weren't really thought of yet. People thought of still thought of melodies. So my issue with scales is that, is that they basically kill the melodic instinct. And so, yeah, your fingers get fast, but if you've killed your melodic instinct in the process, mm, not such a good thing. So I teach scales very differently now. I have people improvise in them for quite a while before they ever do it in a mechanical way, if they ever do. For example, I can play in any mode, in any key, but I've never practiced them mechanically. So that's my issue with scales, is if we do them mechanically, then we dull our musical instinct. So I'm always saying, look, if you're going to practice scales, do it in musical ways, improvise with them, create melodies, um, play them in a context where you're musically engaged, so you're, you're bringing in phrasing, you're bringing in different touches, you're bringing in pedaling, you're bringing in musical sensibilities, not killing them. Fantastic. I, I find it hard to imagine who could argue with that, Forrest. Oh, you'd be <laughs> surprised. Because look, scales are a sacred cow. Um, scales are, you know, you if you're a piano teacher, you wouldn't think of, of, of not teaching scales. Mm. Well, I teach my students to play in all the keys and different modes but I just don't do it in a mechanical way anymore. And, and it is quite controversial. I've had teachers get very mad at me, very heated during my workshops. So I, I actually kind of enjoy the discussion, <laughs> but it's gotten me in a lot of trouble. I see. Well, uh, I'll avoid getting you in any more trouble and um, be <laughs> respectful of your time. This has been such a fascinating conversation. Thank you. And I think there is so much there for everyone listening to think about and apply in their own musical life. Uh, there's lots of avenues there to explore in terms of creativity and finding your own identity, whether it's a blend of those four arts or, or something you come up with yourself. Um, I know that the ideas you've shared today, Forrest, are really going to help people on that more creative path. Well, I appreciate this conversation and I appreciate your clarity and, and your questions. And I think you've really helped me get to the essence of it, that, that art is really about discovering who we are, what we love to do, and there are so many different ways in music that haven't really been encouraged. And I'm glad you allowed me the chance to share them. Terrific. Well, we did promise everyone listening one more demonstration of pattern play. So if you wouldn't mind, could I ask you to take to the keyboard again? Yes. All right. So here I am at the piano and I'm going to demonstrate another pattern for my book, a very popular one. So in the pattern play books, there's always a pattern and a vacation, which is a contrasting pattern. So that way, your accompaniment has a lot of variety. You can keep moving between the two. So here's the pattern of a blues piece called Blues on Black. And it's E flat, B flat, D flat, and E flat. Sounds like this. I'm just playing quarter notes. I'm gonna do that four times and then move down and do this pretty much the same thing starting on A flat. So I'm going to be playing A flat, E flat, G flat, and A flat. So what I've got here is a, a pattern made of eight notes. So there, third time, and fourth time. And then I go to A flat. And I keep repeating that. Now, in my right hand, I'm just going to create on any black key and any A natural. Now, together, this makes what's called an E-flat blues scale. So all I'm doing here is playing that pattern in my left hand and adding a melody using those notes. Every pattern after a while gets tiring, so it needs what I call a vacation. And in this case, the vacation is B flat, F, A flat, B flat, going back to that A flat pattern. 
and then the pattern repeats again. So that's the materials. Um, and I can create for the rest of my life with that scale and the pattern. I might play notes together. I think it's time for a vacation, so here I go. And there you go. Wonderful. Well, I have no doubt that will inspire everyone listening to go and learn more about pattern play and discover all of the good things waiting for you at forestkinney.com. We'll have a link to both of those, of course, in the show notes for this episode. Thank you again, Forrest, so much for joining us today. Thank you. I've really enjoyed this. Want to know how musical you are and how to improve? Find out free at musicalitypodcast.com slash checklist. That was such a fun conversation. You can tell that Forrest has been true to this message of creativity in music for many years from the clarity he has when he talks about it. There was a ton packed into that short conversation, so let's quickly recap the big points. Despite being such a well-respected and hugely published music education thought leader, Forrest didn't actually begin with talent or a gift for music. In fact, he said it was a very painful experience for him early on, because he didn't start piano until he was 16, at which point his peers were already far ahead of him. His first recital was a particularly painful and embarrassing experience, he said. Ultimately, what enabled him to become the musician he is today was, in fact, realizing that he had a musician in himself to become. And it wasn't just a matter of following the path that had been laid out for him, memorizing classical repertoire and perfecting finger technique. It was a matter of returning to his original urge for music, which was improvising and creating his own sounds at the keyboard. Once this clicked for him, he was easily able to translate all of the musical knowledge he'd accumulated over the years into something far more rewarding and valuable, and ultimately build his career on that. We talked a lot in this conversation about creativity, and it's important to keep in mind that you do not have to be a creative or an artist to create in music. In fact, everybody who picks up an instrument has the right and the ability to express their own ideas through music. We talked about Forrest's four arts model for thinking about this, which lays out four different areas where you can express your own musical ideas. Interpreting music, meaning playing something that's been written by somebody else and bringing your own musical expression to it, is just one of those four ways, even if it's the one that most of us fall into by default. The other three are composing, arranging, and improvising. We talked a fair bit about improvising and how it doesn't have to be a great gulf between carefully playing prepared repertoire and magically creating amazing improvisations out of nowhere yourself. In fact, using methods like Forrest's pattern play approach, you can give yourself clear building blocks to improvising. If you listened to our recent podcast episodes in Improv Month, you will have heard us talking about patterns, as well as playgrounds and the idea of setting constraints for yourself as well as dimensions to explore. This is the way we teach improvisation at Musical U, and it's a great match for Forrest's pattern play approach, which gives you concrete building blocks for improvisation while still allowing you plenty of room to create your own musical ideas with them. Composing, Forrest says, is analogous to writing, whether that's emails or essays, and it requires you to put your thoughts in careful order and set them down in a particular form. Arranging, on the other hand, starts from a given musical idea, such as a song or maybe just a melody, and then it's up to you to improvise or compose the remaining pieces to create your own music based on that starting idea. Although each of these four arts is distinct, you do not need to pick one of the four. In fact, every musician will have a blend of these four abilities, and it's up to you which you most want to nurture and develop. I found it fascinating to hear how Forrest, despite being renowned particularly for improvising and for composing in his pattern playbooks, he is still dedicating large amounts of time to the interpreting part of his skill set, and I loved his explanation of how all four feed into each other. Your improvising benefits from your interpreting, just as your arranging benefits from your composing, and so on. Although analogies between music and language can sometimes be a stretch, I think this is one case where it works very well. 
None of us would doubt that learning to write well will help you speak more eloquently, nor learning to tell a story well out loud will help you when it comes to writing. The same is true for all of these four arts of music. As well as our innate desire to create, we as humans all have the desire to progress in our lives and know that we are moving forwards towards the goals that we set. I think that's one reason why the standard music education, and notice I'm careful not to say traditional after Forrest set me straight on that one, standard music education is so heavily structured around checkboxes and yes-no, right-wrong requirements because of our need for an easy, clear sign of progress in our music learning. There is a lot to be said for that, but it's not necessarily compatible with this broader understanding of what it takes to be a musician, and in particular to the kind of musician you want to be. For skills like improvising or composing, it's much harder to say, was that right or wrong? Was it better or worse than what I did before? But that's not necessarily a bad thing. Ultimately, that question of, am I happy with the thing I created, is the only one that needs to matter. I couldn't resist the chance to ask Forrest about two topics that often seem at odds with talking about more creative and freeform ways to learn music. One of those is music theory, and I loved Forrest's description of it as being at its best when it's enabling creativity and providing you with options, rather than the more standard way of teaching it which focuses on reducing creativity and removing options. When it comes to scales, he may get in trouble with the piano teachers for telling students they don't need to endlessly run their scales up and down the keyboard, but I think his final demonstration of pattern play with that blues example was a great demonstration of what a scale can be, simply a set of notes that you use for a musical purpose. Forrest is someone I've wanted to talk to for a long time, and this conversation was such a pleasure. I hope that you enjoyed it as much as I did. And I'm confident you're going away with some fresh ideas, enthusiasm, and inspiration for finding the musician you want to be, and tapping into your creativity, whatever that might mean for you. For more inspiration and insight from Forrest, check out his website at forrestkinney.com. That's F-O-R-R-E-S-T-K-I-N-N-E-Y.com. And of course, we'll have a link to that and everything we mentioned in the show notes for this episode at musicalitypodcast.com. Thanks for listening to this episode. Stay tuned for our next one, where we'll be talking about different types of scales and the musical flavors they produce. Thank you for listening to the Musicality Podcast. This episode has ended, but your musical journey continues. Head over to musicalitypodcast.com, where you will find the links and resources mentioned in this episode, as well as bonus content exclusive for podcast listeners.